Christmas. So glad you could join us today at the Christmas Eve service at Trinity. My name is Keith, and I'm one of the associate pastors here, along with Eileen. And Jim is our lead pastor, and Jerry is our music director. I want to fix the sound after I, I get out of this. But um, we ask you to uh, follow along the worship and we're not going to announce the hymnals, so we just ask you to follow the hymnals. As you're able, would you stand with me for the call to worship? <coughs> Mighty God, you have made us and all things to serve you. Now ready the world for your rule. Come quickly to save us so that violence and weeping shall cease. Your children shall live in peace, honoring each other with justice and love. loving and gracious God, incarnate one, light of the world, draw close to us as we pray. We praise you for the warmth of friendly greetings this night, the beauty of our church music, and tastes and colors of the Christmas season, the joy of worship tonight. Receive us now, rich in things and poor in spirit. Hear the humble prayers we make and the songs that we sing. Shine the light of your star on us tonight, that we might see the Christmas story with new eyes. Open our hearts to hear the story again for the first time. Through the child of Nazareth, our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christmas season, the pastors in various Christian congregations have to decide whether they're going to preach from Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus or Luke's. Tonight, there's a bonus. I'm going to read from Luke, but I'm actually going to talk about both stories. From the Gospel according to St. Luke, beginning in chapter 2, listen for the Word of God. In those days, when Emperor Augustus Caesar issued a decree that a censor should be taken of the entire Roman world, and everyone had to go to their hometown to be 
registered. So Joseph went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David. He went there because he was of the house and lineage of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, but she was already expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in that manger. There were shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and the shepherds were frightened. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid, because I bring you good news, and it'll cause great joy one day for all the people. But today in the town of David, a savior is being born to you. He will be a Messiah. You'll call him Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby there, wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts also appeared with that angel, and they were praising God, and they were singing, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those whom God favors. When the angels left and gone back to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, well, let's go to Bethlehem and let's see this thing that's happened. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, and the baby was lying in that manger. When they'd seen him, they spread word concerning what had been told them about this particular child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary, she treasured up all these things. She brooded over them in her heart. The shepherds returned. They were glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard, all the things that they had seen. All of these things came to pass just as the angel had told them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Is 
Please be seated. There was a little medieval monk whose name is Dennis the Short. Dennis was not good at math. And he tried to calculate Jesus' birthday, and he wanted to make it the year zero. The thing is, Herod is alive when Jesus is born. But Dennis began four years after Herod's death. So the way we have figured Jesus' age over the years, you need to add some years to Jesus' age because he probably was born somewhere 6, 7, 8 B.C. That's the time that Matthew's story begins. When Jesus' ministry spanned some years, several years, Jesus is in his 30s, probably pushing 40. In those days, the average height of a man was about 5'1", about 140 pounds. So I don't know what kind of image you have of Jesus. But I would suggest that more than likely, he was probably about this tall. And he was a skinny little dude, about 140 pounds. And yet, that little man has changed this world because of the way he chose to live in relationship to God, other people, and the world. Jesus is executed in the year 30. Peter, Paul, who will carry Jesus' message for a number of decades, they're executed in Rome in the early to mid-60s. By that time, so many of the initial or early followers of Jesus who had actually been eyewitnesses and those who heard what he had to say saw what he was able to do through his power and relationship to God. Most of those persons were no longer living. And the community of faith that Matthew was addressing, they didn't know anything about Jesus. They knew about the cross, but they didn't know where he grew up, who his parents were, and so Matthew thought it's probably a good idea to answer those questions that you're asking by writing an account of Jesus' ministry. In Matthew's Gospel and in Matthew's Gospel only do you have the Magi who are following a star and using that star to sort of track where this child is going to be born. Those who are involved in astronomy tell us that every 800 and so odd many years there's a triple conjunction or configuration of planets, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. We know that one occurred somewhere between 10 and 8 BC. Had they seen that triple conjunction in the, in the heavens, it would have been bright enough to have put them in motion to try to figure out the significance of whoever was going to be born under that star, that configuration. Jupiter was symbolic of a great king who was to be born. Saturn was symbolic of something, someone who would be a messiah and whose rule would transform all life as we know it. Mars was to indicate that it had to do something with the end of time, the end of things as they knew it. These ancient astronomers were Persian. They came from present-day Iran. They were more than likely priests of Zoroaster. At the time of Jesus, and 500 years prior to that, the Zoroastrian religion was the dominant religion in all the world, and would be until 500 A.D., so these priests show up into Jerusalem and they inquire of Herod, where is this person who's going to be born according to the stars? Messiah, but more than that, 
king of the Jews. Herod thought he was king of the Jews. Now these magi, in a sense, had just said to him, you may think you're a king, but there's somebody running around out there in nappies who's got more power than you do. And Herod was afraid. And so he had 2,000 children executed because he wanted to eliminate his competition. That's how Jesus and his family were greeted with the news that this child has special properties. The Magi were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. So they went back to Persia by another way. Joseph took his, his infant child, his wife, fled to Egypt and didn't return until Herod was dead. And then they returned to Nazareth in Galilee where Jesus would grow up and where he would live until he launched his ministry. And that's Matthew's account. Now Luke, which you heard, he doesn't know anything about a star. He doesn't know anything about any magi. Luke begins by saying, <clears throat> in the sixth month, an angel came to Mary and announced that she would be great with child. Now the sixth month of the Jewish calendar, Aviv, is September. So do the math. If Mary has conceived Jesus in September, that baby is going to be born somewhere in April or May, which is precisely what Luke believed. Because while Jesus is being born, he has shepherds grazing sheep in the fields. Now these shepherds, they didn't own these flocks. They had nothing to do with that. As a matter of fact, they had done something that had resulted in violation of the law. And they were being punished. It was probably a misdemeanor. But they were being punished. And what they had to do was to graze the sheep that would be used for sacrifice at Passover. Those lambs without blemish were known as the tower of the flock. Perfect in every way. Luke's theology has Jesus born right in the midst of all those lambs that are going to be slain at Passover. So these shepherds are grazing those sheep that are going to take away individual sins or the sins of a family. You just have to have one purchased at the temple and dedicated to the sins of your family. And in the midst of all those sheep, Luke has Jesus being born who's supposed to take away the sins of the whole world. That's Luke's theology. So in a sense, with Matthew's story, the very first people who arrive on the scene, these magis, to proclaim Jesus as king, Lord of lords, are from another world religious tradition. Christians didn't acknowledge it. There were none. The Jewish community didn't know about it yet because the child was just born. These were people from another world's religion who were saying, where's the one who's born king of the Jews? Then you go to Luke's story, and it's not the priests, it's not the prophets, it's not the Pharisees, not the Sadducees. No one righteous that this angel comes to and says, hey, there's something going on up the road. And you need to go up there and see this child that's in a manger. Instead, he appears to those who are under the sentence of the law, whose word is no good. You can't take their word in court because they are convicted felons. 
And yet, they're the ones that have to go out and, as Luke said, spread the word about the story. If you were going to write a story where you were going to try to convince someone that Jesus is the Messiah, is that how you would stack the deck? No. You'd probably have some very wonderful, significant, philosophical, powerful person whose credibility is without doubt or question to tell you about the birth of this child. But that's not how Luke chose to tell it. He said the angel came to the ones that you would least expect to receive this message. And because their word can be questioned, it's up to you to figure out whether or not the story's true. Both stories we're sort of announcing the beginnings of God's heaven making its appearance right here on earth. In the life of this Jesus who's going to show you and me that a human being, an earthly human being, can actually live in relation to God, each other, and the world in a way that's filled with tenderness and forgiveness, mercy, compassion. Jesus, in both accounts, will be referred to as a Messiah. But that just means anointed one. A Messiah, who's an anointed one, is always anointed by God for a particular purpose. A person just doesn't show up and someone say, hey, there's a Messiah. Because someone over here is going to say, well, what's he supposed to be doing? And these gospel writers are trying to tell you why Jesus was chosen by God and what he was anointed to do. I had a little fun sort of researching something that Jesus said in a synagogue one day. Because more often than not, I'll read an English translation and I'll pour through the old Greek of it. But I decided to go back and read what he would have said in Aramaic, which is what he spoke. He was in a synagogue and he opened up a scroll of Isaiah. This is how the Aramaic went. The spirit of Adonai is upon me. And because of this, has anointed me to preach good news to those who are poor. He has sent me to heal broken hearts and to proclaim to those who are in captivity, liberty. He's commissioned me to restore vision to the blind. And this is my favorite. To restore to the crushed with forgiveness. To restore, to bring back into community those who have been crushed by it through forgiveness. He never gives up on this idea that and in his day, the focus was not on an individual's salvation. It was always on the people's collective, the community, the nation. And Jesus wanted to create a tension among all of those persons who heard what he said and saw what he did. He wanted to sort of lead you up to this wall and you can't get over it, under it, or around it if you're toting up to that wall all your old views on God and who God uses in this world to bring about God's rule and kingdom. You've got to change the way you think. He taught it. He said it's not about individual, personal salvation. That's not excluded. It's just not the focus. 
The focus is God's kingdom coming on this earth. God's will being done on this earth as it is in heaven. Jesus did his part because he told us about it and he taught us about it. But the rest of this kingdom coming upon this earth and God's will being done on this earth as it is in heaven, oh, sisters and brothers, the rest of this story is up to you and me. If the kingdom hasn't fully come, it's not God's fault, but ours for not living up to the call of discipleship. Which brings me to your and my story. You heard Matthew's. You heard Luke's. Now according to teachings in Jesus' day in Jewish legend, every single one of you, every single one of us, has an archangel assigned to watch over your life. We know it was Gabriel who came to announce Jesus' birth through Mary. This, tonight, and over these next 12 days, this is the season of angels. So smile when you think of them today. Think of all the people who say they may have seen an angel. Think of the writers of the New Testament who said, you may even have entertained one, but you probably didn't know it. Think of the persons whose lives have been changed because someone bearing a witness from God comforted them, forgave them showed them a little tenderness, accepted them for just who and whose they were. In the Bible, angels are just simply God's intermediaries, messengers. They carry out the will of God without compromising holiness or the transcendence of God. Nowhere does the Bible indicate that they have wings. Nowhere does the Bible indicate that they have halos and they pluck harps. But they have names, some of them. The archangels have names. Tradition holds there were seven. One for every day of the week. Now here's where you come in. And here's where your story unfolds. What day of the week were you born? Think about it. What day of the week were you born? I'm a Tuesday's child. Michael's day is Sunday. Gabriel's day is Monday. Raphael's day is Tuesday. Uriel is Wednesday. Sealtiel, Thursday. Yehudiel, Friday. And Barachiel, Saturday. Everyone here has an archangel depending on what day you were born. And angels are present in both the Hebrew Bible and the Christian New Testament. And so this season, I'm kind of reminded, and I want to remind you, that they appeared not infrequently in Jesus' time and birth and in the book of Acts. And they're always instrumental in the direction and the rescuing sometimes of the faithful. So, why not accept angels as part of the mystery of the Godhead and be comforted at the fact that you have one? Do you know what their responsibility is? 
<laughs> it's to know you like none other and to intercede on your behalf with God. To just let them know you were in Germany earlier and you had safe travels home and there was a family just waiting to receive you back in their arms. And I can remember when my firstborn daughter was trying to make her way out into the world when neither her mother nor I were prepared to receive her. She arrived ahead of schedule. That's the last time she ever arrived ahead of schedule in any <laughs> Maybe you have more than one angel watching over you as you go about your business, the work that you do. Because in so many ways, you may well be because of who you are and whose you are. The voice of integrity in the room. Jesus may speak through your words. Jesus may work through the openness of your heart and the love that you have for others and just your ability to be the best friend on this planet and thoughtful of other people. Maybe just thinking about your angel and the day you were born. Maybe it can cast a glow over your entire personality tonight and make a big difference in your attitude about everything that you do. Especially how you want to live the rest of your life as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. You know what Jesus stands for. And if you want to see that realm a reality in this world, God is using you to bring it about. Jesus has already done his part. We're now faithful disciples. The rest is up to us. And the world awaits. All we have to do is not be apathetic about our faith. But let the meditations of our hearts and the words of our mouths be not only acceptable to God, but aligned with that wonderful spirit that's found its way into this world some 2,000 years ago. And now is our responsibility to live as he did. You said once upon a time that's what you chose to do. And then just don't talk about it. Do it. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As the ushers come forward for our tithes and offerings, I invite you to join me in prayer. Let's pray. We give you thanks, Holy One, for the world of wonder you have made, forest and field, sea and sky, and for the gift of grace you have given us for the one found lying in a manger by those shepherds. Receive these gifts of tenderness and love, of gratitude and praise, and use them for your glory. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
Please be seated. The meal that Jesus was celebrating with his disciples on the last night that he would be with them was either a Passover meal or just on the eve of that Passover meal. And it was very typical for the pater familias, the head of the household, a rabbi, to use that as a teaching opportunity and to use common elements, a shank of lamb, an egg, a rosef, bread, wine, to symbolize them in a new and different way. And so on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread that was there, he blessed it, and then he gave it to them and he said, this will be as my body. They knew it wasn't literally his body, but he's saying, this will be as my body, take and eat. After supper, he took the cup, he blessed that, he gave it to them, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant the new covenant. It's the blood of the new covenant. And it's shed for you, it's shed for many, and it's for the forgiveness of sins. And every time you come together, you do this meal, and you remember me. And he said that in the context of a meal where they were remembering the liberation through Moses and the Passover. But you do this meal, and you remember me. And so, pour out then your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here. And on these gifts, bread, wine, make them be for us, the body and blood of Christ, that you and I may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Make us one with Christ. And then make us one with each other. And only then send us out in mission and ministry throughout all the world. And keep us in that world until Christ comes again. And we all feast at his heavenly banquet. In and through the ongoing presence of your Holy Spirit in this church and all others, all honor and glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The body of Christ. The cup of salvation. May these be for you and for me, the food and drink that we're going to need on this journey that we call life. There'll be three stations tonight, the lectern, the pulpit, and here in the center. In the center station as well, there is a gluten-free uh, environment, should you prefer. The mode that we use is intinction. Simply come up, take a table bread into the palm of your hand, dip it into this chalice to the words of blessing. In the United Methodist Church, everyone is welcome. Everyone is invited. All things are prepared. Would you come?
If you'll follow along in the bulletin, there's a prayer, a blessing. It's about 2,000 years old, and in all of the little health churches where the early followers of Jesus met to celebrate this meal and to celebrate his life, these are the words that they said. Follow with me together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go forth the strength the strength of your spirit, and hear ourselves to others, in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Emmanuel, God with us, a promise kept. By definition, a baby is dependent on adults for everything, food, shelter, protection, and love. A child unable to use logic and reason, it needs constant attention. But baby, baby Jesus, this one child created the entire world. This child existed before anything or anyone. This child was God. Imagine, he's the creator of the world and suddenly, he feels cold and hungry. Imagine, becoming human was not a twist of fate or a punishment from a higher being. It was a choice. This child was a king, a king in a dirty stable, wrapped in rags, but a king with a plan. This child would bring hope, not a wish, but the confidence that comes with God's good grace. This child would bring peace, even in the midst of great suffering and trials, a peace that assures his followers he is in control. And this child would bring joy, for he would deliver us. And this child would bring love, a love that would never be taken away, a love that is beyond our understanding. All the promises of God are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is our hope today and forever. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please turn to page 
2090, in the Faith We Sing hymnal, we'll sing verse 5. of our service and as Silent Night is being sung, pastors Eileen and Keith are going to approach your aisles and take the candle that you have. They'll be holding theirs in this upright position and you just simply lean your candle into it and pass it on to the persons next to you in the same way.